as an naturopathic doctor, I'm always looking for the root cause of disease. And so when somebody comes into my office and they have a lot of things going on with their health, and they're also suffering from digestive symptoms, then some of the first things that we start to address is we look at how their digestive system is functioning. right? Because let's say I start to give somebody dietary changes or a supplement. So if I give somebody dietary changes or dietary recommendations and their digestive system isn't working properly, we don't know if they're able to even absorb those vitamins, right? So you, it's just a waste of money if you're taking in vitamins and it's not able to be incorporated into your body. So the first thing we do is start healing the gut, okay? And Hippocrates, the father of medicine, so he's like the guy that started it all, he wrote the Hippocratic Oath, so we should listen to him what he has to say, he told us to do no harm, right? He says that all disease begins in the gut. So what he found working with patients and developing medicine is that he'd always start with, with treating the gut when it came to healing people. So that's why it's important that we're talking about digestion today. So I'm a naturopathic doctor, that's my, my profession. So I'm just saying briefly what a naturopathic doctor is, because sometimes people don't know. So we're, um, we're general health practitioners, so we go to school uh, for eight years. We do our four-year undergrad degree and then a four-year naturopathic medical school degree. It's very similar to uh, a medical degree, like for conventional medicine. Uh, we're licensed health professionals in Ontario, so we're regulated just like medical doctors, nurses, chiropractors, physiotherapists. Uh, but we see health a little bit differently. We look at how the body functions as opposed to looking at your disease. So when we're ordering lab work or we're taking a history and talking to you, the patient, we're trying to find out, like, you know, not whether you're sick or not, because we don't define health as the absence of disease. We want to see how your body is actually working, right? Because if our body's not working properly, we don't just go from, like, perfect health to sickness overnight, right? It's a, it's a, it's a progress of health to disease. And so we try and get, we try and intervene in the middle before you get sick, and we try and do preventive strategies and help your body work better so that you don't get sick in the future, right? That's where we come from. That's where we work best, I think. And we're always looking at the root cause. So one of my patients, if someone comes to see me and they're suffering from migraine headaches, let's say, I won't recommend Advil or painkillers because you're probably not getting headaches because you have an Advil deficiency, right? There's probably something going on under the surface is causing you to have this pain all the time. So we're looking at why is your body responding this way? What's it trying to tell us? And we try and treat that. And so we're not against medications or vaccinations or any of that, but we don't have the ability to prescribe them in Ontario. So if people do need medications, then I'll refer them back to their medical doctor or specialist. But what I use to treat people is diet and lifestyle and herbs and vitamins, natural remedies and acupuncture and those kind of things. So within my scope are the natural remedies, okay? But that doesn't mean that that's all you need. Sometimes you do need medication and then we'll, we'll recommend you see your doctor about that, okay? So you don't have to choose either or. It's, it's an integrative system. Okay, so I'm just briefly gonna tell you guys what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the digestive system. So our body, so we have like the inside of our body, right? And then the outside world. And there's different situations going on, different temperatures, different bacterial balance. Our digestive system is actually the outside world. So when we eat something, it's not, it's inside our body, but it's not actually inside, inside our body yet, right? So our digestive system is this hollow tube that winds through our insides, starts off in our mouth, and ends up in our, oh, you know where it ends. <laughs> and, and, it, it, and so when we take in food, it travels through this long tube and slowly gets broken down and absorbed into our body, which starts to fuel our cells and allows us to function and move and think and, and experience everything that we experience. Um, but when we eat something, it's not part of us yet. Right? So it's still the outside world. So the wall of our digestive system, it has, it has a job of trying to figure out what to take in and what to leave out. Okay? So this is the primary job that it has. It needs to break down the food, absorb what we want, and get rid of what we don't want. So it starts in our mouth. We have a long tube that goes down our throat called the esophagus. 
Uh, then we have our stomach, so kind of a big bag that burns and dissolves our food with stomach acid and churns our food up to make it into a liquid. Then that liquid goes into our small intestine where the protein and the fat and the carbohydrates and the vitamins are absorbed. And then that tube ends up in our colon where, uh, where a lot of bacteria exist. So we have about like five pounds of bacteria in our stomachs. And those bacteria help our immune system work better. They help us digest the rest of the food that hasn't been absorbed. They help with water balance and they help make uh, really important chemicals that uh, we need for our body to work properly. And then whatever's left gets pooped out, okay? So we have that long tube, the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, anus. And then we also have these auxiliary organs, our liver and our gallbladder and our pancreas that help with, um, with digesting food. So like carbohydrates and sugar and fast protein. So all in all, the whole tube is about 30 feet long, so 9 meters long. It's pretty long, right? It's longer than we are tall, unless you're a basketball player. Yeah. <laughs> and by the time, so from the time it takes us to eat something to have it enter our body, it's about um, 50 hours, so 50 hours to digest something. So when you have an apple today, 50 hours later, that apple ends up in your body where you can use it as fuel, okay? So almost everybody I see in my practice has some kind of digestive issue, probably about 80% of people. But in the general population, it's estimated that about 40 to 60% of people have some kind of digestive issue. And a lot of us don't, like some of us know and it, it's bothersome, but some of us it's just something you live with. It's like, yeah, I feel bloated after I eat, but like everybody does. Or yeah, I have a lot of gas, but that's sort of normal. So a lot of us are constantly struggling with suboptimal digestion, we don't even, like it's just something you, you're, you've gotten used to. Uh, and so here's very common symptoms that are related to digestive impairment. So the first and very common one is, is GERD, so acid reflux, right? So that's um, when the acid from your stomach ends up in your esophagus. And sometimes it feels like heartburn, but sometimes it just feels like, um, like a lump in your throat or a hoarse voice, like it doesn't always show up as a burning feeling, right? And so what does your doctor usually recommend if you have digestive issues? Antiacid. Antiacids, yeah. Or proton pump inhibitors. So something that lowers the stomach acid, right? And so that's not always the best solution, uh, but it depends what's going on. And then a lot of the time people will experience bloating, so there's sort of gas in our stomach or intestine. So after you eat, you feel like you're, you wonder if you're in your third trimester or what's going on. <laughs> Um, and some of us feel tired after eating, so a lot of my patients tell me that after lunch they feel like they could take a nap, like they wish they lived in Spain and they could have a siesta. Uh, and that's just because all the blood is going into your uh, digestive system, right, and leaving your head, because the digestive system is requiring a lot more work than it should. Gas is a big one, right? Not, sometimes a little bit of gas is normal, but a lot of us are struggling with constant gas, and that also goes with the bloating or stomach pain, and then pain and cramps as well, right? So um, depending on what's going on, that can be another symptom. And then there's diarrhea, so frequent stools, right? Watery and loose stools that are very urgent, and then constipation. So ideally, in, in, in Asia, in traditional Chinese medicine, they recommend having a bowel movement after every meal, so three times a day. <laughs> so how many people here go three times a day? Oh, wow, some of you, that's good. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. Oh, good for you guys. We should have prizes at the end. Oh, that's awesome. That's really good because I rarely see that, in, um, especially in women. Uh, it's very uncommon, right? So especially in, in North America, we often don't go. And some of us, it's, we find it normal to go like every couple days or every three days sometimes. Yeah. We definitely, you know, constipation is not fun. Okay, so these are all within the realm of IBS, right, irritable bowel syndrome. So it's a very common syndrome where we're just simply not digesting food properly. Um, and then undigested foods and stools is a common one, so I often tell my patients to tell me what their poop looks like, to describe the color, texture, and to look and see if there's any undigested food. So it's common to get, like, 
corn or something like that, but we don't want to see like pieces of food because our body should be breaking down everything we eat and you should be able to recognize it in your schools. All right, so those are obvious, right? It's like actually what's going on in, in your poop or in your digestive system that, that's showing up as these symptoms, but there's also other symptoms that aren't as clearly linked to the digestive system, right? So there's these like inflammatory symptoms. So like acne or migraines or joint pain, arthritis, uh, weight gain, even if you're you know eating properly and you're, you're not losing weight or you're gaining weight for a reason that's unclear to you, uh, thyroid issues, especially those autoimmune thyroid issues, weird skin rashes, so rosacea, eczema, even psoriasis potentially, and allergies, so even seasonal allergies. So all these symptoms have to do with inflammation, and we're going to talk about the connection between inflammation and the digestive system. But they don't always, like, it's not always clear, right, why your rash might be caused by an issue with your digestion. But that's what we do when we're kind of following Hippocrates' Um, advice that all disease begins in the gut. We want to look at why is there inflammation in your body? What's going on? And usually the, the root cause is in the gut and in how you digest. So even though it's not clearly digestive stuff that's going on, we always treat digestion or look at it at least. So first of all, I want to talk about the gut-brain connection. Okay, so who here has had the experience like well, who here has heard the saying, like, oh, I have a gut feeling, or I hurt my feeling in my gut, right? It's like it's kind of intuition in your gut. Um, or who here has experienced, like, digestive symptoms when you felt anxious or stressed or nervous? Yeah, right? Really common, right? So we know that when we have certain emotions, sometimes that can manifest in our gut, right? If you're feeling upset about something, you notice these digestive symptoms. That's because we have this nerve that goes from our brain to our digestive system, and also goes through our heart, too. And so this nerve is what relaxes our body. So when we're relaxed, that's when, we, that's when our body is able to digest its food and to sleep. So we have our rest and digest part of the nervous system and our fight or flight part of the nervous system. So if you're scared or stressed out or anxious, you're in the fight or flight mode, you know, if you're rushing to catch a bus or something like that. And then when you're relaxed and eating a meal nice and slowly and quietly on a terrace in southern Italy, you're in the rest and digest mode, right? And so that's when we digest our food the best. That's when our digestive system is active, creating digestive juices, absorbing our stomach acid is highest and able to break down our food, and we're not... Um, and, and we, we're sending blood flow to our digestive organs so they can work better. So it's like a, a light switch. Like it's turned on or it's turned off, okay? And so if we're chronically stressed out or rushing, then we're not gonna be digesting as well. So I see this a lot. Like I'll see patients who are very stressed out, who are, who are kind of eating in their car or they're standing up to eat or they're eating on the go, right? Like we have one-handed meals, like wraps and sandwiches and stuff like that. And so that's not that great for our digestive system. We're not able to digest properly. In Chinese medicine, they, they believe in the, the mind-body connection. And their idea is that we digest our thoughts in the same way that we digest our food. So if your mind is constantly like chewing and ruminating and thinking, um, then we're not fully present in our body and we're not fully able to digest. So they found that people who were sort of like, uh, had a tendency to ruminate and worry would also have bloating and loose stools and had problems absorbing their food. So it's a really interesting connection. And I see that a lot as well. And our gut cells, so the, the cells that line that tube of our digestive system, they also produce hormones that our brain needs for us to feel happy, like serotonin. So I'll see patients with depression or anxiety that have impaired gut function just because their digestive cells aren't properly making the hormones that they need to feel happy and to feel pleasure. And then um, our gut as well, and I'll talk about the inflammation connection a lot more, but our gut is also where a lot of our immune system lies and that is what, get, what triggers inflammation. And if we're feeling inflamed, or if there's lots of inflammation in our body, it also makes um, 
it also impairs our brain's ability to work properly. Okay. Our brain doesn't have pain cells. So usually when you have inflammation, like if you've ever experienced joint pain, it hurts, right? But your brain doesn't have pain receptors. So if your brain is experiencing a little bit of inflammation, it's not, we don't feel pain in our head. We may get headaches from the, the nerves or the, um, the blood vessels in our head, but our brain's not gonna hurt. And, but what we will notice if our brain is inflamed is we'll feel like brain fog or we'll have memory issues or we might feel depressed or we might feel tired. So we'll get those kind of symptoms, okay? So gut brain connection, it's like, our gut is called our second brain, yeah. <laughs> So our gut is also where, about, where most of our immune system is located. Because remember I told you that it's still the outside of our body, technically. We haven't fully absorbed the things we've eaten into our body yet, right? It's in us, but it's not actually part of us until we digest and absorb the food. So our, our body is like pretty like, how can I say this, like, right wing. Like, our body is like, would vote for Donald Trump, let's say. So our body likes walls. Our body wants to prevent stuff from getting in. So we're very uh, strict about this. We don't want to let just anybody in. We don't want to let whatever you're eating into our body. So we have this, like, army that's lined up. This is a very complicated picture, but we have this army that's lined up along the lining of our digestive system, and it's on guard all the time to make sure that bad stuff can't get in. And any time that army gets triggered, so let's say we ingest something toxic, or we eat some salad that's got E. coli on it, we're gonna have major symptoms, right? We're gonna have, we're, our body's gonna be like, get this out, right? And so that can trigger some inflammation. So inflammation is when our immune system is active. When our immune system is active, uh, we start to get pain, we get swelling, we get redness, um, and we get, what's the other one? Pain, swelling, redness, and swelling, I said. And and heat, okay? So like if you think about when you hit yourself or puncture your, your arm, it's like red, it's swollen, and it, it sometimes feels hot to the touch, right? And it hurts. So that's kind of what's going on in our body. We get joint pain, it's like, especially if you have autoimmune joint pain, like rheumatoid arthritis, it's like your joints can, can get red and they, and they really hurt. So we've got this kind of chronic pain going on in our body all the time, that's inflammation. Advil is anti-inflammatory, that's why we take Advil to lower the pain, because it lowers the inflammation. But because our immune system, most of it's located in the gut, that that's where inflammation gets triggered. That's sometimes why we have inflammation in the first place, because there's something going on um, where our gut is reacting, and it might be reacting for um, for a reason that's not required, that's not necessary, okay? So about 20 years ago, if you talked about leaky gut, you would be laughed at in the medical community, and now there's tens of thousands of papers, so scientific papers, about, it's called intestinal permeability on PubMed, where they, where they put scientific journals, okay? So now there's like a ton of research going into this idea of leaky gut, this idea that inflammation in the body and autoimmune issues and pain in our body is, is actually starts in our digestive system. And so what happens is, I talked about that wall, right? So the barrier between the outside world, so, or the inside of our intestine walls, and the rest of our body. So let's say this is sort of like what we eat. What we eat gets put here, right? And this is like in our body. And these are our gut cells that line the walls of our intestines. So depending on what's going on in our lifestyle or what we're eating, we can start to get this, in, this inflammation of our intestine. Okay, so something is activating the immune system in our intestine. So it could be stress, so something, you know, you're, you're constantly rushing, you have these worries, you've got tons of work to do, your mind is going, going, going. Stress can cause inflammation. It might be toxins. 
So things from our environment that are not supposed to be getting into our body, right? Pesticides on our foods or fragrance or chemicals from just living in Toronto, right? Being exposed to car exhaust or cleaning products and that kind of thing, all right? So those can also cause inflammation because it, it's like little tiny poisons that are uh, causing inflammation and, and upsetting our body in some way. Uh, it can be certain food particles. So one of the big things you might have heard a lot about, right, is gluten intolerance. And it's, it's not necessarily just gluten that people can have an issue with. It could be dairy products or eggs or peanuts. It could essentially be anything that, for whatever reason, your body has a problem with and starts to trigger inflammation in your gut, okay? So let's say you do have a gluten sensitivity. You eat gluten. That starts to cause this situation. So it starts to cause the leaky gut, okay? Certain medications can cause leaky gut. So uh, antibiotics, birth control pills, or some, uh, they just seem to trigger a little bit of inflammation in the digestive system, okay? Uh, pathogens, so these like bacteria, viruses, and funguses that are not supposed to be in our gut, okay? And then uh, organ malfunction, so like slow liver or our digestive system, is just, it's just slow, it's not working properly, okay? That could be like a vitamin deficiency, could be just a process, like a, the aging process could be something, maybe because we're stressed out again. So all of these things can contribute to this inflammation in our gut. And what happens is, the, when our, so our gut's got this like, this is like a healthy gut. It's closed off to the outside, right? It's like a nice, it's like a wall that Donald Trump wants to build. It's like nobody's getting in, nobody's getting out unless we say, okay? But when we have inflammation, like it's, it's like the security breach. Now all of this stuff that shouldn't be in our body is getting in, okay? So part of these food particles are getting in, part of these pathogens or toxins are getting in. All right. Normally, cells need to go through a like, really tight process, right? They got to go through border security, show their passports, and there's this whole process of getting different foods into the body. But when those walls are broken, they're just getting in between cells. There's no regulation, right? And and that's a problem in our body. So what happens? Our body goes to war. So our immune system starts to kick in, right? Our immune system is like our military. Our immune system is like we need to. Uh, we're being poisoned, we're being attacked, and we need to clear uh, whatever's going on, whatever's attacking us, we need to clear that out. So it starts to trigger inflammation. You start to get heat, pain, swelling, redness, okay? When there's inflammation going on, we can start to react to other foods we're eating, okay? So maybe we had a problem with gluten, now we've got this immune activation, and we're not just reacting to gluten anymore, we're also reacting to dairy. We're reacting to eggs now. Okay, so now everything you eat, you're like feeling pretty uh, bad. You're getting headaches, okay? And, and then you start to get immune system issues, so like autoimmune disease and things like that. So when you think like, it's like, why, why is, you know, why is my eczema or rosacea, why is that caused by what I'm eating? Because what you're eating potentially could be causing more inflammation in your body, and that inflammation is showing up on your skin. Okay, so that's the process. That, that that's the hypothesis that we have. So what we have to do then, if you have eczema, it's not that it's not putting a cream on your skin, right? I mean, it could be just to calm you down, so you're not so you're not itchy. But in addition to putting a cream on your skin, we have to like heal your gut lining and calm down the inflammation, okay? How clear was that? <laughs> so it gets pretty technical, so I'm sorry. So, okay. So a lot of people, so who knows somebody here who's gluten-free, let's say? No, wait. Oh, you no. Okay. Uh, who knows someone who's avoiding gluten, gluten-free? Yeah, you guys know someone, or who is gluten-free? or tries to not eat gluten, okay, okay, right. So this person might be like, I'm allergic to gluten, right? That's what they might say. So we'll say like, we're allergic to this food. So it's not exactly an allergy. An allergy is when you eat something and you need to go to the hospital, right? So who knows a child, let's say, or somebody who has a peanut allergy, 
right? Yeah. Uh, so that's a lot more known, right? Because that's like a life-threatening situation if you're exposed to peanuts. So you eat a peanut or you touch a peanut, the peanut gets into your body, and the immune response is so quick that that person may, um, may stop breathing, right? And they need to carry an EpiPen and they need to go to the hospital. That's what an allergy is. So an allergy is like a very quick reaction, it's a very severe reaction. Or some people may say have a gluten intolerance, okay? Or like a lactose intolerance. So an intolerance is when you don't have an enzyme. So an enzyme is kind of like a pair of scissors that breaks down certain sugars in your food, okay? So lactose is a sugar molecule. Your body can't cut it. It's like, it's like um, two, two sugar molecules stuck together and they need to be cut in half and then you absorb each molecule on its own. If your body doesn't have the scissors to cut that molecule, it, you start absorbing water in your gut, and then you get like diarrhea and cramps, and you feel really uncomfortable. But if you drink lactose milk, so the sugars have already been cut up, you're okay. Or if you eat yogurt, sugars have already been broken down, you're okay. Or if you eat cheese that's mostly fat and protein, it doesn't have much sugar in it, much lactose, you're okay, right? So it's more about like your ability to break down the food properly. That's an intolerance. And you, you react to that as soon as it gets into your digestive system. So someone will drink milk, if they're lactose intolerant, they're gonna feel like, oh my God. Like you have a nice big ice cream cone and you're like, okay, I'm in the washroom for the next few hours. Tomorrow I'll be okay though. It was worth it because it was ice cream, right? <laughs> Right? And then you can get that, it's not just lactose intolerance, you can have it from some of the sugars that are in certain vegetables, right? So lots of people will get um, cramps and bloating after they eat chickpeas, legumes, broccoli, right? Those are big ones, garlic. Kiwi is for you, yeah. Yeah, you get that, yeah. So that's about like just not having the enzymes. And then we have sensitivity. So this is sort of a new area that there's a little bit of controversy around it. This is where most gluten issues fall under. So this is, uh, you eat a food, and you're not allergic to it, like you're not going to die, right? That would be an allergy. Like you don't need an EpiPen. You can maybe tolerate a little bit of it, but you're not going to feel well after having that food. And it's not going to happen necessarily in the next hour or the next few minutes or even the next day. It sometimes takes a few days to manifest. Remember how I said it takes 50 hours for when you eat something for it to get to your body? So it's going to take maybe that long or longer for that, in, that inflammation to start to occur. Okay, so I'm just going to go back to this, right? So for this process to happen, when you start to get food intolerances or food... So food intolerance is not accurate, food sensitivities, right? So you start to get this process to happen, this leaky gut, that can take a few hours, it can take a few days. So it's really confusing because some people will come to me and be like, you know, I have um, autoimmune issues, I have an autoimmune thyroid issue, and, and I'll say, okay, so, you know, there's a connection between autoimmune issues and food, food sensitivities. So let's try and take out gluten. Or how do you feel when you eat gluten, or wheat, bread? And they'll be like, oh, I feel okay. Like, I'm not sure. And then they'll record their food for a couple weeks. And they're like, well, I had bread today and I felt okay. But then a few days later, I felt really bad. And I'm not sure, but that day I had really healthy food. I didn't eat bread. So it's really confusing because it doesn't happen right away. So it can take a while for us to really uncover what's going on, what food you might be reacting to. And so the food, react the food sensitivities are what cause that leaky gut. Okay. So controversial, but there's more and more research showing that that they do exist, that people do feel bad when they eat a certain food, and when they remove that food, they feel better, and when they reintroduce the food again, they feel bad again, okay? And it doesn't just have to be gluten, it can be anything, right? But gluten's a common one. All right, and then I mentioned that we have these gut bacteria. So we have 100 trillion bacteria in our guts, okay? We have five times the amount of bacteria in our gut than we have cells in our body. So we have more bacteria than we have us. Okay, 
So it's like, we're mostly bacteria, basically. And it's about five pounds that we carry around. So if you stand on the scale and you're not happy with your weight, don't worry, because five pounds of that weight is not you. It's your gut bacteria, so you're good. <laughs> so you can subtract five pounds from your weight and feel better about yourself. Um, so our gut bacteria is actually what helps to educate our immune system. So our gut bacteria is like teaches our immune system to function properly because most of our immune system is in our gut. Okay, It helps us digest things. So some of those bacteria contain enzymes that break down things like lactose and the sugars that are in like broccoli. Um, it also helps, they eat our food for us. So they digest some of the fibers that we eat, all right? And they also produce certain hormones. So they can make us feel hungry, they can make us feel happy, they can make us feel sad. They also produce certain toxins if they're bad gut bacteria and they can make us, they can contribute to inflammation. So this is like a whole cave of research that's just beginning. And we're kind of in trouble because when we discovered antibiotics, it was great, right? Because who wants to have, have you know, an antibacterial, who wants to have a bacterial infection, right? We, we, that saved a lot of lives when we were able to take antibiotics for infections. But antibiotics also kill all of our good gut bacteria and that can shift our balance. And then we start giving all of the animals we eat antibiotics. So now cows, chickens, pigs, they get antibiotics to prevent infections. Those antibiotics end up in their meat and in the dairy and eggs that we consume. And those uh, antibiotics end up in our, in our bodies. So we're like constantly exposed to all of these antibiotics and that's affecting our gut bacteria. And that's affecting our ability to digest, it's affecting our immune systems, and it's affecting our ability to produce the hormones we need to like serotonin, our happy hormone, or our hunger hormones. So a lot of the time, like who here really loves sugar and like kind of can't live without it? No one. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I get a lot, like I see a lot of people that have that problem where they're like, I can't give up sugar, I crave it so much. Like, it's almost like a, a monster lives inside me that wants sugar, and even if I tell myself I'm not going to have a cookie, like, I'll have one and then I'll eat ten. And, yeah? It's salt. Potentially. Well, yeah, so they don't really eat salt, so it could be other reasons why. Yeah. That you're like, I'm not having it. Yeah. So, that's another, so there's some other reasons for that. But the gut bacteria, they eat uh, they can eat all different things, but a lot of them eat sugar. And so if they want, if that's what they primarily eat, they'll like create hormones that enter our brain that ask us to eat sugar. So they kind of like control us. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of crazy. So sometimes uh, I'll recommend probiotic to my patients and they're like, oh, I don't crave sugar anymore. It's like, it's like magic. All right. So there's a huge amount of research going on with this and uh, establishing a good gut bacterial balance is really important. So when we have a growth of bad gut bacteria, like an overgrowth, and not enough of the good gut bacteria, then we get something called dysbiosis. Okay. So this is a problem where we're like, we've got too many of the bad guys, not enough of the good guys. That's, confused, that's causing inflammation, we're not digesting properly. Um, you know, and we're not uh, we're not getting the hormones that we need. We're not getting the right hormone balance to feel good, to have energy, to break the right kinds of foods, all of that stuff. So there's a few there's a few causes of that, right? So there's antibiotic use, which I mentioned before. So antibiotic use will kill a lot of your good gut bacteria, and it may leave some of the ones that we don't want. Stress can also affect the our gut bacteria. The stress can contribute to inflammation. And then a diet that's really high in sugar and low in fiber is a really common one. So sugar tends to feed the not so great gut bacteria and uh, not enough fiber because the gut loves fiber. That's what they that's what they eat. That's what the bacteria eats. So if we don't eat enough fiber, there's nothing for them to eat, and we're encouraging bad ones to grow and not good ones. And so some of the symptoms of that gut bacterial overgrowth or that imbalance are things like depression, so that's a really common one, because we're not, those gut bacteria aren't producing serotonin 
and now you have to take an antidepressant that increases serotonin, so now you need a medication. Uh, they can cause inflammation, right? So they're triggering that leaky gut situation. They're not able to teach our immune system how to behave properly, and our immune system is overreacting. You can get IBS and IBD, right? So they're not properly breaking down our food, and that's causing gas. It's causing uh, the it's causing more water to be drawn into the colon, which is causing uh, diarrhea. Or we're not having proper bowel movements, like our, our digestive system is not moving properly. Like it should be moving every time we eat, ideally, and that's not happening if our gut bacteria is thrown off. And then autoimmunity, right? So again, the immune system doesn't really know how to behave. It starts reacting to, to harmless food we're eating, or it starts reacting to, um, to other things that we're putting into our body. Or the opposite can happen where our immune system actually decreases because our, our gut bacteria are actually helping us defend against some of the bad things we don't want, like some of the viruses and bacteria. And so what I'll see a lot of the time is people come in who are like getting, you know, they're getting colds a few times a winter. Uh, you know, their kids are bringing them, are bringing in germs from daycare or school and they're getting everything the kids bring in. And they're also not able to recover from colds as quickly. So they're getting sick and it's taking longer than a week to clear that cold. So they're sort of like coughing for, for weeks, right? Like a university student. <laughs> so when we have that sort of lowered immunity, we, we want to look at the gut and make sure that we have the right gut bacteria that's keeping your immune system strong so you can fight stuff off. All right, so that was like, a, that was kind of this overview, right? So with the gut, there's lots of different things going on. We're looking at food sensitivities, potentially. We want the right bacterial balance. We want to balance the gut-brain connection, right? So we want to manage stress. And sometimes stress, we don't really, um, it's not very clear that we're stressed out, right? So I'll ask people how stressed they are, and they'll be like, oh, I'm not stressed at all. And then we do a, an inventory, and they're like, always rushed, they don't have any time, you know, they're, they're always, their mind's always going, they're waking up in the middle of the night. So we want to make sure that we're, especially around meal times, as relaxed as possible. And in, so in Chinese medicine, they know that gut-brain connection very well. And so what they'll do is, like, if, so one of my teachers told me that if you go to a cafeteria in China and there's like hundreds of people in this cafeteria eating, you don't hear anybody talking. All you hear is like slurping and people are eating their soup, right? So they, they understand that like when we're eating, we're eating. And when we're finishing, now we can talk. Like we're quiet, we're just focusing on that one thing. So that's something called mindful eating. It's like really paying attention to what, how we eat, how we chew, eating slowly, and that's activating our digestive system, right? It's like that light switch we talked about, rest and digest, fight or flight. It's like we're turning on the rest and digest and we're just doing that. We're not like, oh, honey, this is good, we're here too. Well, guys, don't forget, like we're not somewhere else. We're here and we're digesting. It's really important. I do not do this. I'm bad for doing this. My family is Italian and we eat like someone's going to take it away. <laughs> so I have to remind myself of this as well. So slowly and mindfully chew. Chewing is part of the digestive process. We were talking about that, right? It's like we, we eat too fast is a big part. It's sometimes a big problem. We want to eat foods that are going to feed our gut bacteria and add good gut bacteria into our bodies. So fermented foods that contain probiotics, so um, a lot of the good gut bacteria, like foods like yogurt, sauerkraut, right? Uh, and we want to eat prebiotics, so the fibers that the bacteria eat. So we want to we want to eat the good bacteria, and we want to eat their food too. So give them some food to eat. That's the prebiotic and probiotic foods. And then. So prebiotic is the food for them, and probiotic is the, the actual bacteria. So it's like dog and dog food, right? So the prebiotic food doesn't have bacteria in it, the, um, but, the, but it has the food for them, the fibers, okay? And I'll tell you what those fibers are, what foods have those fibers, all right? Um, and then, especially if there's inflammation going on, we'll, we'll identify and eliminate food sensitivities. We'll start with a diet diary, and we'll look at what people are eating. It's, when you have a food sensitivity, it's usually a food you eat every day. Okay, so that's why gluten is such a big one. There's other reasons why gluten is a culprit, 
but it's just so common in North America for us to eat meat, right? Like you wake up in the morning and you have cereal, then you have a sandwich for lunch, and then you have pasta for dinner, and you usually have bread with that. So there's like gluten everywhere, we're, we're constantly getting in, it into our bodies, and so if our gut's inflamed at any point in our lives and we're eating tons of gluten, that can trigger that uh, inflammatory reaction. Uh, dairy is another one for the same reason, because we do eat a lot of, of dairy typically in North America. But if dairy, is, if dairy is fine or gluten is fine in your body, it's not causing that, then there's no reason to avoid it. But again, it's hard to tell if you have a food sensitivity, right? Like I mentioned, like sometimes you can have a reaction a few days later. So we want to really make sure that you're actually okay eating it. And some of the ways that we identify the food sensitivities is we can track our food and, and try an elimination diet where you, you remove it for about a month and you see how you feel. And if you react to that food and you don't eat it anymore, you should feel better. Like all your rashes should go away. You should feel like, oh, I, I can concentrate now. I remember everyone's name. Like, I feel great. Uh, I don't have any pain. I don't have any joint pain. So when you remove that food, that should happen. And then when you reintroduce it, you should feel the symptoms come back. So you're taking gluten out, let's say, you feel great, you add it back in, you have a nice bagel, and you're like, oh no, uh, a few days later, now, I've, uh, now I, I feel joint pain, or I feel brain fog. That's one way. Another way is to do a blood test. So you get blood taken, and that um, the blood test will tell us what foods your immune system is reacting to. And the blood test I use tests 120 different foods. So we test, like, fruits, vegetables, proteins, as well as wheat and dairy and all of those common foods. So it's basically looking at everything that you would normally eat and it's trying to see like what does your immune system have a problem with. And then once we know that, then we take those foods out. So either way you take the foods out to, to really test it. All right, and so once we've, we've done that, uh, we can heal the gut. So we're letting the gut lining heal. And then the last one, this is just like a good one, is we want to eliminate um, refi refined sugars, and that should say like inflammatory foods. So again, like inflammatory foods can be foods that you're sensitive to, um, or you know things like like a lot of people will be uh, like drinking a lot of alcohol, right? Or um, or maybe like there's a medication that's causing inflammation, like we mentioned. Right? Or maybe there's some toxicity, there's some uh, pesticides in your food, or something that's going on that's causing that inflammation. So we don't just sort of say, like, everybody do this. We look at, at the, the specific person that I'm working with, and we try and find out what could be going on that's causing those symptoms. Right? And refined sugars, just because I mentioned, like, they're feeding the bad gut bacteria. So as much as we can, we can remove that, like, white table sugar, right? High fructose corn syrup, that kind of thing. Like typically honey and maple syrup and fruit are those are fine. It's just like the refined stuff, you know, candies and stuff like that. Right? What was I gonna say? Oh, and there's another thing I want to mention too. So there's this really cool study involving mice. So most studies start with mice and then they move into human, they move on to humans. So they want to see, like, they want to give the mice the mice have a really terrible diet and see what happens to them. So they gave them a diet of lard and sugar, right? And so the mice all got sick, of course, right? They got diabetes, they died earlier than the other mice, they, they didn't do well. But they were feeding the mice uh, throughout the day. So they, the mice just got their pellets of lard and sugar and they could eat whenever they wanted. So they just kind of let, like kind of how we, we just kind of eat all the time, right? Um, and then so they were like, okay, so a bad diet makes mice get sick. Mice eat lard and sugar, they get sick. But then they took the same, the researchers were like, well, what if their, um, when you eat has something to do with how your diet affects you? So they only fed the mice for 12 hours. So same diet, lard and sugar, like same bad kind of like junk food diet, but they only fed them from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., let's say. They only got to eat for 12 hours, and then the other 12 hours in the day, they were, they were fasting. They weren't allowed to eat. And those same mice, they didn't get sick. So same terrible diet, the only difference was they stopped eating after 12 hours a day, and they were okay. So it's interesting because our body is supposed to exist in a state that's fed and a state that's fasted part of the time. 
But what we'll do is like we'll kind of we'll wake up and eat, and then we'll eat late at night, and then we'll sleep, you know, right after eating, or we'll have bedtime snacks, and we don't get that 12-hour fast. So a lot of us sleep for like seven, eight hours. Then you wake up and eat again. So there's sort of like only eight hours that you're not eating, or even less if you don't sleep that much. So it's really important. Like sometimes I'll, I'll recommend to people just don't eat after dinner, right? And that has a huge impact on our ability to regulate our food intake and to manage our weight. Because who eats like really good choices after dinner, right? It's usually that's when the ice cream comes up. So when you stop eating after dinner, that's like you're, you're kind of avoiding a lot of those uh, high calorie, lower nutrient dense foods. And we're and something is going on in our bodies and our hormones that is preventing us from getting things like diabetes or heart disease, even if we're not eating that great. So that's something cool to keep in mind. And so I'll, I'll sometimes tell that to my patients. And it, it, uh, also, so they did the same study in humans. They told the humans, don't eat after dinner. So try and fast for 12 hours a day. And those people reported losing weight. So it was like a slow weight loss, but it was significant. They didn't change their diet. They just ate whatever they wanted. So they lost weight, and they also slept better, which is really cool. I didn't put that on my slides, but that's a cool study. So it's sometimes not always what you eat, it's how you eat and when. Okay. So when we're talking about the gut healing foods, the probiotics, remember this is like the dog and this is the dog food. Okay, so this is the bacteria and this is what the bacteria has, eats. So probiotics, you can get probiotic supplements or you can get fermented foods and eat fermented foods like yogurt, kefir, 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 I never know what to say, uh, sauerkraut, kimchi, kombucha. So all of these are foods that have yeast and bacteria in them. And when we eat those foods, the, the bacteria enters our body and it, it populates our gut with good gut bacteria. Okay, so that's a really important thing, especially if you've ever had to do antibiotics, right? Like, it's, there's not like we should avoid antibiotics. Like there's definitely reasons to take antibiotics, but when we're doing a round of them, if we need them, we should also be supplementing with fermented foods or a probiotic to make sure that we're not eliminating all um, our good gut bacteria. Right. So I often recommend like kefir. So kefir is so a lot of people ask like, what's a good probiotic I should take? You know, are they any good? Are they even? Are they? Do they even do anything? Because you know, some supplements aren't, aren't that great quality. So I'll just recommend to people to, to drink kefir because kefir has about 10, 11 different strains, which is pretty good. It's like a multi-strain probiotic and it's food. And the, the, the kefir, the milk itself, also feeds the bacteria. So you're getting the, the, pro, the prebiotics as well. So you can do that. And it's food, right, as opposed to a supplement. So you're actually filling your stomach with something. So kefir is fermented milk. It's like a watery version of yogurt. Mm -hmm. And kombucha is what hippies drink. It's like a fermented tea. So you can make it yourself at home. Uh, sauerkraut, right, fermented cabbage. And kimchi is like a spicy fermented cabbage that's a dietary staple in Korea. The sauerkraut is just cabbage and salt water in just Yeah, exactly. So the bacteria comes from the air. So when you're when you're massaging the cabbage, it's getting that bacteria from the air is uh, fermenting and populating in the sauerkraut itself. So anytime you don't, you can't heat it though. So that's why bread is not a good probiotic because bread, yes, it has yeast, it ferments from the air, especially sourdough. But when you bake it, those bacteria are killed off. So they're not really um, uh, well, it, like. So the bacteria actually helps digest the gluten in the bread, interestingly enough. So a lot of people with gluten sensitivities, they find that if they have sourdough bread, especially homemade sourdough or you know sourdough that's been uh, you know, made by someone in a natural way, in a slow fermenting way, that they can digest that and feel pretty good. So sometimes it's just the bacteria that's properly breaking down the food. And same with yogurt and kefir. Like I find a lot of my patients have problems with dairy, but they can, they can deal with yogurt, especially good quality yogurt.